in life. Did you all get the message? Got it. Awesome. Just waiting here one sec. Nice. Got this here. Good. Okay, so we are live. And good morning, good afternoon, um, everyone. Welcome to this fine seminar. Um, and my name is Adriana Maldonado Chaparro. I'm professor at the Universidad de Rosario in Colombia, and I will be your host for today's seminar. I'm really happy that you're all here today. Um, first, I would like to um, thank our previous speakers. Um, our panel last week had one of the most views on the YouTube, but also one of the highest attendance of all our seminars. So thank you to Odette, Dan, Alison, and John for their great um, discussion and all the energy and effort they put on making this a successful panel. Um, just because some of you will or might leave before we get to the end of the seminar. Uh, next week, we have Liz Lang. Um, she will be talking about setting the foundations for life, long-term effects of early life environment. So I welcome all of you to come and join us for our seminar next week. And this week, um, today's seminar will be uh, presented by Damien Farin. Um, Damien got his PhD at the University of Oxford in 2014, and in the same year, he did a postdoc or studied a postdoc at the University of Oxford and the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, but he was based at California, University of California in Davis. So he spent a lot of time in the U.S. back in that year, and but that was basically the time when I met Damien. Uh, I think it was early 2015 at the Gordon Conference. Um, then in 2015, he got his group leader position or principal investigator at the Department of Collective Behavior at the Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior. Back then was the Max Planck of Ornithology. Um, and then in 2020, he got the Excellence of Professorship at the University of Zurich. So he was holding two positions in the Max Planck and the University of Zurich at that time. And in 2022, um, he moved back to Australia, his home country, um, as a professor at the National University of Australia. And since then, he's been working 50-50 in between University of Australia and University of Zurich. Um, Damien's research focuses on understanding how individuals navigate their social landscape and how social life impacts the interactions between individuals, uh, physiology, and the ecological environment. I mean, his group combines advanced analytical and data collection techniques that allow them to scale up from interactions among individuals to emerging properties at the population level and processes. I mean, his publication record is demonstrates the great contribution his work has done to the development of behavioral ecology, but in particular to, to the development of the study of social behavior. Damien has published in a wide range of journals, and I'm gonna go and um, say which ones, it's just a very long list, but his work has been cited thousands of times. Um, one of his highlights um, is that Damien is very committed to the support of the career of his uh, lab members, but not just, also his colleagues. Um, and according to him, in his very own words, one of the most rewarding parts of his career is that five of his previous um, postdocs are now faculty members. So yay for his uh, great support. And I just want to say thanks to Damien for all the contributions, not just to the um, area of social behavior, but for the support that he has uh, given all of us in his lab um, throughout our careers. And so with no further ado, um, today's seminal title uh, is Uncovering the Hidden Social Life of Birds, 
and Damien, um, please, thanks for accepting the invitation and the mic is all yours. And I'll stop sharing my screen. All right, thank you, Adriana, for the very, uh, very nice introduction. Let me just put all my things in place. Good, I think we're good to go. You can see my screen okay? Yes. Thanks. Okay, so thanks. And today, uh, well, first I want to thank Adriana, actually, because she's been chasing me for one of these seminars for quite a while, and I've been a bit of a slippery fish. And there's kind of a few reasons for this. One reason is actually because the previous amazing postdocs and current postdocs in my lab have done a really amazing job in already sharing many of the themes that we study in the, in the lab, so in their own uh, fine seminars. And the other is also because I really wanted to present, I think, something a bit more about my own personal journey in all this and my own journey of discovery. So as Adriana said, we really specialize in my lab in studying sort of the interaction between uh, individual social behavior and the environment uh, in which they live. And Adriana and Maurizio led a fantastic paper, I think, highlighting really the foundations of, I think, of our work going forward which is the, how these things feed back on each other, how um, the social behavior of animals affects how they experience their environment, but also how that environment and those experiences shape their future social decisions. Today, I wanna to sort of zoom one level out further from that, because when we think about animals and um, animal groups and populations, we often think about a single group or a single population, but actually, different groups and populations often interact with each other in a number of different ways. And actually in my, and here in Zurich in the 1960s um, is where Hans Kummer was and Hans Kummer first sort of described what we now call a multi-level society in primates and the Hamadrys baboons when he was working here in Zurich. And uh, these multi-level societies is going to be the focus, the main focus of my talk today and how we've been sort of discovering both the presence of these societies in different taxa, but then also trying to now understand some of the, the reasons why they exist. So multi-level societies are kind of uh, defined sort of by their structure, which is that you typically have um, individuals are nested within some core unit, which is often what we call the, the group, right? Or the family unit or things like that. But then these interact regularly and with some non-randomness with a number of other ones of these units across different social scales. Okay, it could be just two levels, it could be families interacting with other families, or then those sort of broader groups can also sometimes interact with other broader groups uh, at the level of the population. And these have been uh, quite widely described now since they were first defined in the 1960s uh, by Kuma, but almost uh, until recently, almost exclusively in large mammals. So mostly in primates, uh, but also in cetaceans and elephants and things like that. And I think um, even though we sort of are getting a broader picture about the presence of these societies, there's still been quite a lot of uncertainty about exactly why they exist, what the benefits that individuals gain and so on from them. So I was really struck by this paper that came out uh, earlier this year in which they really started to identify one uh, key driver on underpinning the evolution of multi-level societies, which is the ability for groups to adapt uh, to living in colder environments. And this to me points to one sort of emerging uh, narrative here, or emerging idea, which is that multi-level societies might be particularly important in harsh environments. So this talk is going to be my story of how we have discovered uh, multi-level societies in a number of bird species, and how we're starting to understand now that this is really seems to be an important adaptive feature of these societies to survive harsh conditions uh, that those individuals face. For me, it all started uh, after I finished my undergrad. I'd never studied biology. I studied engineering, computer science, and I was working in the steelworks uh, south of Sydney in a place called Wollongong. And I had the luck or the fortune that this town just on the east coast of Australia also happened to um, be a great spot for watching seabirds. And uh, in going out to watch these seabirds, I also got involved with a group who would uh, 
catch these albatross uh, and other seabirds whenever we went out as part of a long-term ringing project. It's been going for about 50 years, one of the longest uh, running seabird projects. And that's me in the stripy jumper there waiting to catch a bird. And this is uh, what it looks like. And it's absolutely amazing to, to have these birds. I was lucky to observe a whole bunch of different uh, incredible things that they do. But one particular observation I made really stuck with me, which is that one day we went out and we caught uh, two albatross, one pretty much one after the other. They were right next to each other, picked them up, brought them on the boat, and we realized that both of these birds had already been rings. They've already had a metal band on their leg, which had been placed by someone before. When we looked and read the number on those bands, we discovered that they were consecutive with each other. So this suggested that they had probably been caught before together in the past. When we got back to shore, back in those days, you didn't have internet on your phone and so on. When we got back to shore, we uh, went into the database and found that they had, had in fact been caught together on almost exactly the same day of the year, and but about nine years beforehand. And I thought, isn't this amazing? You know, these birds are completely on the other side of the world from where they breed. They breed on the South Atlantic. And uh, yet, you know, nine years apart on almost exactly the same time, they're together here in the same place as they were caught previously. Around the same time, I was also setting up pro a project of my own, uh, catching some uh, smaller, but much, much smaller birds uh, in the Australian bush, uh, focusing on thornbills, these bottom three are thornbills and the scarlet robin at the top and individually marking each of those birds with color bands and recording who was hanging out with who. Because actually when we were putting up the nets initially in this project, we also would, I was also discovering that we would keep catching the same birds together that had uh, different, uh, that had very similar ring uh, numbers. And what I found by sort of tracking this and building a social network of who was with who, found that there was a whole lot of strong social connections, of course, within species, but also it seemed to be, the different colors represent individuals of different species. It seemed to be that individuals from different species were also hanging out together non-randomly. So as I was going into the literature to try and find out some more about what might be going on, I sort of couldn't find many very good answers. And I've been thinking about this a lot more, more recently and thinking about the drivers or the reasons why or the, the sort of main drivers behind our understanding of animal, different animal social systems. And if we think about how people study primates, and this is a group of baboons, and classically researchers will go out day after day, walking behind these uh, primates and observing all sorts of different things that they do socially, individually, and so on. And if we think about how people have studied birds, Got a slightly different picture, right? We study a lot about social behavior in birds, but on the whole, this kind of social behavior has been focused in and around the nest. And this very good logistical and other reasons for this, right? If you're trying to sort of understand and, and observe and reobserve a bird continuously, it's much easier to just wait for it coming to the nest than it is to try and follow it. So we try to follow it. Most of the time, you'll end up with a view like this, which is a bird flying over the horizon, and you're not much better for it. So in this book chapter that I shared with Adriana, which is hopefully going to be out next year, but you can download it from my website. So I went back and thought a little bit about how the process of how we study the animals that we study has an impact on our understanding of their social lives. And I'm going to give you one uh, example of this which is about cooperative breeding. Right? If you look at social behavior, you search social behavior in birds, almost all of the examples you're going to get are about cooperative breeding. And the reason for this is almost there in the name, right? Alexander Scotch, when he first described co cooperative breeding, described it helpers at the nest. And if you look at this uh, NSF pamphlet, pamphlet that I found on the internet, uh, when I search cooperative breeding, I found very much that all of these examples all involved individuals giving parental care pretty much all at the nest. And so I went into some of the uh, literature on this and I picked up uh, Christina Reel's really nice paper from 2013, when she looked at um, evolutionary routes to non-kin cooperative breeding in birds. And she had sort of 
scour the literature for all the evidence of the different cooperative breeding, breeding species. And she found that there were 213, uh, or she listed 213 species. And among these, four species are precocial breeders. So all but 200, all, all 209 species are altricial breeders. So that means that the chicks are a little bit like uh, this, right? They're a bit, they're sort of helpless in the nest until the uh, parents uh, and the parents come and bring them food and until they grow up. And only four species uh, of this entire list are chicks where the once they hatch, they're, they are already uh, se uh, semi-independent and can wander off, you know, think about chickens, for example. And then if you look across all species, right, about 11% are precocial breeders. Okay, so this suggests that there's a disconnect between, or there's a connection in the sense between being altricial and being cooperative. And in fact, it has been even suggested as a hypothesis that altrician, altriciality is connected with cooperative breeding. Go to the Handbook of the Birds of the World and open to any of the interesting bird families like the guinea fowl, um, and you will see very typically passages like this. But very little is known about the breeding habitats of most of the members of the family. In some cases, only the size and color of the eggs basically represent all of the information that is known. So we have to extrapolate for all the species in this family from the one species that has uh, ever had any study, the helmet of guinea fowl. But if you go out into the field, and if you're lucky enough to observe some of these, you might observe something quite interesting. Right, so these are vulture and guinea fowl. I'll talk a lot more about the species. This is my main study species at the moment. And you might see something like this. Right, so this is a helper that's covering a bunch of these uh, very small precocial chicks, right? While the, in this case, the father is looking on. And um, you'll see very shortly that all this is happening within a broader group and other individuals come and they give all sorts of different help. A couple of them are, uh, have taken some of the other chicks that were out uh, feeding as well. Here they come. Right, and you can see a few, you'll see in a second a few of the other chicks coming as well that were feeding with some of the other helpers in the group. And so this to me is pretty, I mean, for us, it's undeniable that these birds are also cooperative breeders. But of course, this was completely unknown because no one had ever studied uh, this species before we did, before we started in 2016. And so I think part of the disconnect between precocial breeding or uh, and altriciality and cooperative breeding comes from a number of different reasons. But one is that these observations are harder to make. Okay, most of these precocial species are prey birds as well, and so they're extremely scared of, of any uh, disturbance and humans and so on. So it's very difficult to get up close. Uh, the behaviors are less well defined, right? Because we can't just say, well, they've come and given food at the nest. In terms of most precocial species, the chicks are, are already feeding themselves. And the helpers are doing things like giving them cover, protecting them from predation, protecting them from other groups, uh, also pointing to where food is without actually directly feeding them. I think this results in smaller sample sizes um, and also you know, more difficult to define costs of helping because realistically those costs are probably relatively minimal. And I think also all of this combined also sort of suffers a little bit from academic gatekeeping because these kinds of behaviors are not what people who study cooperative breeding traditional think, traditionally think of as cooperative breeding. And yet if we look at the literature now, about 10 years after, uh, Chrissy Reel's uh, paper, and we find that there is now evidence, I think pretty good evidence, at least 10 different species of galliforms alone, let alone all the other precocial breeders, have been observed to breed cooperatively. So this includes the pheasants and the quails and so on. So the point I kind of make in this uh, paper is that I think a lot of our understanding of social behavior has been largely biased by how we have studied the social behavior of birds and not that uh, specifically that birds express some particular types of social behaviors versus others. So I think the really interesting question and where I want to go to next is to ask, you know, and this is really the focus of my research in birds, is what is going on in the rest of the year when they're not busy breeding 
And to me, this is the period when they're doing all the interesting stuff. I appreciate that this is extremely hard to do. And as Adriana mentioned in her introduction, you know, a lot of this has been made possible by uh, using modern technological techniques uh, for collecting data. So we've uh, started already doing my PhD uh, using pit tags on, on tits. And you'll see on the Guinea file, we use a lot of GPS tracking. And more and more now, I think uh, artificial intelligence tools like on these sociable weavers uh, are becoming uh, or coming online and becoming available. Now, I'm not going to talk about the tits or the sociable weavers. If you're interested in the tip work, there's already been two fantastic uh, previous fun seminars recently. I dropped first just a few weeks ago, and Lucy Upland, I think about a year ago, who have covered uh, the system that we worked on uh, in Oxford uh, together. Rather, I'm going to take you to a sunnier and I think a more interesting place. This is in the Lakipia Plateau in central Kenya, uh, looking over the foothills of Mount Kenya here. And at the center of um, here in Lakipia is the Impala Research Center, a place that I first went as a postdoc when I was working on baboons, and then I returned to as a PI to set up my own study. The reason I went there is because of these birds, uh, no guesses there. Um, you know, these uh, vulture and guinea fowl, I was just absolutely uh, struck by both how striking they are, but also uh, by some of their behaviors. And I hope this, this video shows you a little bit of that, which is how cohesive and how incredibly social they are. So when I was out there, these birds, of course, weren't marked. They couldn't identify individuals, but it was pretty obvious that through this landscape, I could see these quite large groups of birds walking through. I was counting groups of 60 plus animals that were you know, like this, all standing very close to each other and very much moving together as a group. And so uh, in setting up this project, we had to overcome a whole bunch of challenges and how to catch them and so on. Luckily, there's strong cohesion means that we can get them all to go into traps like this, a big walking trap. Um, walking traps now are much bigger than this one. And uh, when all of the group are in there, we have a little remote control and we can release the, uh, the gate and they all get trapped in there. And once they're inside, uh, we can sort of put them all out, put them in holding cages and process them. And, and importantly, we can fit each of the individuals in the group with a unique combination of color bands on their legs. And you can see these are quite uh, easy to observe out in the field. So this is yellow, pink, orange, pink, white pop. And each bird has a unique, distinct combination of these colors. And I'm lucky to have a wonderful team in Kenya that are out there every day that are collecting uh, the, the census data on who is together in each of these groups from one day to the next. We've been doing this now since 2016, and we're building up in what I think is a really interesting picture of the social dynamics of this population. And if this is uh, sort of a horizontal version of a social network where each of the columns is a time point, so two month periods, and each of the blocks of lines represent distinct social groups uh, that we can identify in that season. And then the colors from one point to the next uh, reflect the sort of flow of individuals in and out of these different social groups. And you can see that on the whole, there's quite a lot of stability, especially during these long dry periods like there are in the middle of this plot. Also, you get some sort of merging, uh, some fusion, and some fissioning of these groups under different conditions. So to quantify this a little bit more um, uh, numerically, what we have been doing is we've been using these solar-powered GPS tags that we fit onto the back of about 10% of the population of guinea fowl. So within every single group, we have sort of two to six individuals that are fitted with one of these GPS tags. And what this does, we have about 18, depending on the season, we have between 18 and about 25 different social groups in the population that have uh, these GPS tags. And it gives us uh, simultaneous data, data on where each group is and where each, um, and how they move relative to each other. So this is data from just one day. We get a point every five, or burst of points every five minutes most of the time as well as a lot of one hertz data as well from these solar panels uh, that work extremely well. And what you can see is, you can see 
how sort of dynamic uh, this the movements and the, these different groups are within this population. You see a lot of them that are overlapping, some that come together temporarily, some that split off again, and so on. And these data revealed exactly that different groups often will often roost together. So in the middle of the point here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but in the middle of this point is a, is a large communal roost that holds about four to six different groups. Some nights there's another one here that can hold three or four different groups and so on. And during the day, each of these groups split off with the same membership day in, day in and day out and to go and forage in different areas. Some days two groups will forage together, most of the time they'll forage apart and so on. And what this basically, when you put all these data together, when you put all the observations of group membership, which is stable over time, plus the GPS data that gave us information about the group to group contact, we basically discovered that these guinea fowl live in a multi-level society, much like what had been described in, um, in primates, for example. So this is sort of one picture of that, and we can show, see that this society is stable, the sort of structure of the group to groups interactions is stable across uh, different seasons. And yet, you know, and all of this is managed as happens with these completely overlapping home ranges between the groups. I, also, I, mean, I really enjoyed this work. It was a particularly nice point in my career because it's not every day that you get to really make a discovery like this. And I think it also, I think, appealed a lot to the general public. We had a lot of press coverage for this. But of course, it begs the question, why does such a society exist? Why do they do this? Why not just have normal fish and fusion and so on? And so the last couple of years, uh, in large part through my ERC grant, uh, we've been asking uh, exactly this question. I think if I were to summarize, try and summarize it in one sort of slide, this is kind of what the best I've come up with over the last couple of days, which is that what we see is that different group, different sized groups bring kind of contrasting costs and benefits. So if you're in a smaller group, and you're trying to, for example, make collective decisions or avoid predation, you typically are going to do less well than if you're in a larger group where you benefit more from collective intelligence or more from the dilution of risk of a predator attacks. And so we can see sort of uh, contrasting costs and benefits across this diagonal. At the same time, if you're in a larger group, you have greater competition, greater uh, aggression, and as I'll show you also, uh, you pay some efficiency costs which you don't pay so much in uh, smaller groups. So what I think is happening is that a multi-level society really allows animals to balance the sort of short-term benefits of being in a smaller group with the long-term benefits that come from being in a larger group. Right? So in smaller groups, they're investing more in their moment-by-moment -moment sort of fitness, so to speak, Whereas in the larger groups, for example, if you get multiple groups coming together, is when they're much more investing in survival. I want to give you a couple of examples of some of the evidence that we're building uh, in support of this idea. And so this is a short video of one of the groups in which we put GPS tags on all of the individuals. And you can see that they're moving along, uh, albeit fairly slowly here. But as they're moving along, we see a bit of a split and some individuals are wanting to go down to the bottom. This video never quite reaches the end when I play it. Right? So some individuals are wanting to go down in this direction and other individuals are wanting to go in this direction. Now I'm going to come back to this idea of the conflict, but first highlight that whenever this happens, effectively if you look at the movement or the, the speed of the group as they're moving through the landscape, this is slowing them down. Right? These individuals are having to backtrack on, on themselves, whichever one direction loses, and the individual and the group as a whole is moving more slowly and pausing much more. Now we know from, uh, actually from helmeted guinea fowl, which are a model system for uh, physiology of movement, we know that there's a strong sort of nonlinear relationship between the movement speed and the metabolic cost of transport, or right? the cost that it takes for an individual to cover a given distance. So the faster that they go, the, um, 
the less energy per unit of distance that they use. So slowing down should, in theory, make transport, make movement more costly than moving faster. There's also a whole bunch of interesting things because this is nonlinear. You also get some Jensen inequalities and so on that are taking place. So James uh, Clara Serbi, who did his master's in the group way back in the day, and then his PhD, and is now a postdoc with me at ANU. Uh, he, for his PhD, he was very interested in understanding whether organisms like the guinea fowl have. Uh, I should also note that the guinea fowl walk everywhere; they basically never fly, which it's hard to believe, I know, but they really don't like to fly. Uh, so he's interested to understand how the energetics of movement played out in these society, in, in these animals. And there's a basic question that underpins this whole PhD, which was um, what are sort of other energetic efficiency that, um, uh, that individuals can acquire as the distance um, to, to reach high distances, okay? So if you think about the cost of moving 10 meters or 50 or 100 meters, and you, and you scale that sort of movement up to 10, 15, or 100 kilometers, does that relationship stay uh, completely linear, so, so that the cost just grows additively as, the more, as more distance is covered, or do the individuals have some strategies in which they can reduce the sort of uh, transport costs to gain greater efficiency at achieving longer distances? And his focus was mostly on studying dispersing uh, vulture and guinea fowl, but he also did some comparisons of group movements as well. So the basic framework that he had is that he studied groups making their normal sort of everyday ranging movements, which you see an example at the top, which typically involves sort of looping around the environment and coming back to the same roost in which they slept the night before. He also looked at what he calls big days of movement. So what happens is when we get quite harsh environmental conditions, which are something I'll come back to, we see large movements uh, by groups as they leave the, the sort of core area in search of more resources elsewhere. And of course, the dispersal movements made by individual uh, solitary dispersers. And this framework, combined with the metabolic cost curves that I showed you before, and the high resolution one, one hertz, one point per second GPS, allowed him to quantify the cost of transport across these different um, types of movements that we observed. And just very briefly, this is what he found. He quantified two aspects of efficiency. Right, you can basically be efficient by moving very straight, or you can be efficient by moving faster. And he found that in groups, in the lower plot here, both uh, groups and solitary individuals were able to move uh, much straighter when they're making these long distance movements. Okay, so they're, they're benefiting in terms of efficiency uh, by moving straight. But the solitary individuals were a, far more able to, uh, in, to were able to move far much more much faster on average than the groups. So even though the groups were faster when making big movements than when making their normal ranging movements, so they were a bit more efficient, they were not able to match anywhere near the efficiency of the solitary individuals. So this effectively suggests that groups are paying some kind of efficiency cost when making large movements. And so this is one of the costs I think that they're paying on a day-to-day -day basis relative to if they were in a smaller group or, or alone. Now, what about each of the sort of position of these individuals within the group? And so we know from lots of theory, like Hamilton, Seffish, Heard, that certain positions within the group should be safer and therefore less costly. Another condition position should be like at the periphery, should be more exposed to predators and more costly. So in, a, um, in one bit of work that we did actually on this group for which we have the video here, showed you the video, we actually caught all of these individuals and fit all of them with GPS tags. And in about half the group, we also implanted some heart rate lockers. So we could ask the question about what the fine scale uh, physiological state individuals were in as they were experiencing different kinds of social conditions within the group. And I'll note that these groups are not fixed in terms of structure, right? It's not like there's one individual that's always at the front and one that's always at the back and one it's always in the middle, they sort of move around these different positions almost continuously. Okay, so for each of the, so about half the birds in this group, we had uh, heart rate information. So here's a couple of the heart rate plots that we had. They gave us some very beautiful data. 
And then because we had most of the other groups with GPS tags, we could also understand something about the social context in which they were in. Okay, so we could really try to understand how much benefit versus cost they might be paying according to different uh, aspects of being in the group. The first finding, of course, that we found is that the faster they move, right, so the faster their individual speed, the higher the heart rate. Okay, so this is the sort of slope of these lines here. But what's really, what was really interesting is that this was not equal across all the different types of group behaviors. So individuals' heart rates were disproportionately elevated when groups were making collective movements relative to when the group was stationary and individuals were making more individual movements around the group. And so this suggests that being in a group was actually costly or moving, making collective movements as a group was a little bit costly for individuals. Also, contrary to ideas from, for example, the selfish herd, we found that uh, individuals that were more surrounded or more central, centrally located within the group also had a higher heart rate while accounting for everything else relative to those that were more peripheral or less sort of surrounded by others. And this suggests that there's kind of a, a physiological um, uh, consequence of being within these groups, okay? But having higher heart rate is more energetically, energetically costly and can also have long-term uh, physio physiological costs. We thought that we'd see a strong effect of being at the front or being at the back. There was a very, you know, this, was, this quadratic effect was significant, it's all in the right direction, but overall the effect size there was very small. But we did find that when the group was more compact, more aggregated together, then the heart rates were higher. So this is also sort of an independent measure relative to surroundedness, suggesting that being uh, everyone being much closer together was uh, more physiologically sort of activating. But we did also find that being quite separated from the group, like these two individuals at the bottom here, um, might also be a little bit uh, stressful for them as well, albeit that effect was very, very uh, weak. Now, as I said, um, when we have these data from the whole group, like what I showed you in the video before, we can also study situations like this when there's actually conflict within the group and ask about whether this kind of conflicts are also costly. And so here we have two different types of conflict. We have a directional conflict in that some individuals want to go kind of to the south and others to the north, but we also have a sort of numerical conflict that these individuals are trying to act against a much larger uh, subset of the group, whereas those individuals are acting up on a much smaller subset of the group. And we know that the way that these groups resolve these conflicts through work by Donald Papa Georgiou, who's a PhD student, it's through collective decision making. So what we see here is that this, this little small subset doesn't have the capacity to pull the rest of the group in that direction, they fail and then the group continues to move in the original direction of travel. And so this is a formal plot of this, showing that the larger the individuals, the more individuals are in one of these directional clusters, the more likely the group is to move in that direction. We could also ask what the consequences are on the heart rate of these individuals within these groups. And this is effectively one of the, one of the results we have for this, which, which also suggests that being uh, sort of in these complex sort of social situations is also more sort of physiologically stressful. So what we have here is on the x-axis, we have basically the number of potential followers, so how many individuals you're sort of acting against. As so you can imagine on the right-hand side here is more like this group of two, and on the left-hand side is this larger subgroup. And on the y-axis, we have the directional agreement, which is how much uh, so smaller values mean that the, the chosen direction, the preferred directions of the different uh, individuals is going in quite opposite directions. And what we see is that when there's very low directional agreement and kind of high numerical disagreement, we see a much higher heart rate than when there's less disagreement or more agreement within the group. We also see that if we look at who wins and who loses these kind of initiation movements, we also see that the individuals that are not successful typically have a higher heart rate than those who are successful. And this is not even anything, this is completely independent of the fact that they might be moving more or less uh, because we can we control for all of that. And actually we found that 
there's no difference in the amount of movement in the period after these initiations. So to kind of summarize this uh, part of the talk, you know, what I think what this work is really pointing to is that being in these groups actually does entail some substantial costs, right? So the larger the group, we expect that more costs are borne. The study that we did here was actually on a fairly small group of only about 29 individuals, I think, you know, in these guinea fowl living groups, up to 60 or even 90 individuals. And sometimes during, uh, when we have multiple groups together, such as at these communal roofs, we can have two, 300 birds all of together. So we think that these kind of situations have a number of, entail a number of costs for individuals. But what about the sort of benefits, the long-term benefits? Well, we've been both a combination of lucky and unlucky, I think, in that most of my ERC grant has overlapped with what is actually one of the worst uh, droughts that we've had, that, that Kenya or East Africa has had in uh, the last century. And so we've had extremely harsh conditions. So this is what a nice day or a nice period in Impala should look like. And this is what much of the last three years has looked like until just this last uh, European spring when we finally had a bit of rain. And the first time that the birds had bred as, and, and, and as a whole population since 2018. So during this period, we've also been uh, accumulating more and more GPS birds. So we, this just shows you this, this sort of sampling effort that we have when the drought really started in 2019. So most of this period, we've had you know, over 75 and often over, over 100 uh, birds tracked with GPS. And this gives us quite a rich picture of the kinds of responses that these birds are making. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of this. So one thing that they do uh, that is really distinct in this period is that they leave the sort of core area around Impala where we study them and go and search for areas that might be uh, have better resources. And so here what we see are two sets of groups, or well, these blue groups, so four different groups, and these red groups represent three different groups. And during this period of drought that happened, these different set of groups roosted together. And then as aggregates, in this case of the bluebirds, here there's about there's well over 250 birds in this aggregate. They all made these large movements completely outside of their normal home range in search of resources. In fact, this blue group went completely outside of the known range of vulture and guinea fowl. The vulture and guinea fowl uh, do not even sort of range past but halfway down, down this line here. And so, and we, what we see is a lot of these, these um, large extra, extra home range movements are made by sets of groups that are moving together. So we expect that they should be benefiting through some both collective intelligence, the sort of combined knowledge of all of these groups coming together in terms of think, identifying good places to go, but also, of course, safety in numbers as they're moving through habitats where there might be predators that they're not aware of. On these GPS tags, we also collect, uh, on some of these tags, accelerometer. And all the tags have it, but we don't have it turned on all the time because it produces so much data. Our whole project has already produces, uh, has produced over 25% of all the GPS data that's in the MoveBank database because these solar-powered GPS tags produce just so much GPS data. And it becomes a, a bit too burn, uh, too much data to deal with all the ACC data as well. But we also um, strategically collect accelerometer from certain individuals and in certain groups. And uh, Charlotte and the team have been uh, using these data to also classify the different uh, behaviors that individuals are doing uh, throughout the course of the day using uh, different machine learning techniques. And what uh, we find is that when the conditions become drier and we get into the drought, individuals are expending a significantly larger amount of their time uh, foraging. So the, the cost, so as food goes down because the resources become scarce, um, corresponds to a much higher foraging effort among individuals. And we can expect that if they're spending more time searching for food, scratching at the ground, digging with the heads down, but they should also definitely benefit from being in larger groups. There's more opportunities to look out for predators. Some of these birds also had internal body temperature loggers. 
Okay, so, so we can get the internal body temperature. And we also have a bunch of uh, temperature uh, log, uh, external body, uh, external temperature loggers in the environment, both in the shade and in the open to understand the sort of temperature landscape of the environment as well. And what we find is that at about 32 point, uh, or nearly 33 degrees, uh, we see this sort of curvature in which the body temperature of the birds actually surprisingly goes down. And what this happens is basically this is through likely through habitat selection. So they're avoiding being out in the open once the open temperatures become too hot for them. And so using the sort of long-term temperature data, we can also look at how, what proportion of the time across different seasonal conditions, we see temperatures in this higher period here, which is exceeding the sort of foraging limits of the vulture in Guinea fowl. This is what this plot shows here. We have sort of uh, droughts, dry and more intermediate periods. We don't actually have the wetter periods plotted here. And this is a proportion of uh, the time for each hour of the day where the temperature is above this threshold limit. And you can see that as you get dry and drought periods, we have a lot more in the morning. This is the prime foraging period of the guinea fowl. And already about a quarter, one every four days or about a quarter of the time, the temperature exceeds the sort of uh, preferred temperature of the birds during the droughts. So they're much more sort of time stressed as well as heat stressed and food stressed during uh, these droughts. And this also results in, uh, of course, a lot more risk for the groups. And what we also see is that the predation rates go much higher uh, during the, uh, the droughts versus the uh, dry periods and droughts relative to the wetter period. So this is the number of birds taken by pred predators. This is the number of GPS birds taken by predators per month, controlling for the number of GPS uh, tags that we have out. And it's really a lot higher in the dry. I think this drought period, when we were still processing this data, this drought period is a mixture of underrepresented because when the birds leave and we lose these birds well outside of the study area, we can't always uh, go and collect them in time to identify what the cause of mortality was. So it's a bit underreported. Under so all of these effects together combine to uh, sort of having a large physiological effect as well on the birds. So you can see here, this is the average weight of the birds as we, uh, when we trap them. And when we trap them during the drought, they have about 10% on average lower body weight than what we, they have when we trap them during the wet so kind of breeding periods. And this all has, of course, unsurprisingly, uh, survival costs. Okay, so if we look at the monthly survival probability for birds across uh, the different environmental conditions that they experience, we see that there's a big drop here uh, of about one to one and a half percent in the drought periods relative to the, the wetter uh, periods that they have. So what does this all have to do with the multi-level society? Well, actually we see during this uh, dry period a mixture of different strategies by groups. And so we can take this survival probability plot and ask how it relates to the group size that individuals form. And this is what we see, a very clear picture, I think, of the benefits, the long-term benefits that they're getting from the multi-level society. So when the period the conditions are relatively good, when they're wetter, we have this sort of fairly high survival rate across the different group sizes. Okay, we don't really see many large groups, so these, there's not much data on these points here. But when drought hits, we see a really strong difference between those individuals that are staying in the smaller groups versus those individuals that are aggregating up with other groups form much larger uh, period, like much larger social units in the multi-level society. And so to wrap this kind of up, what we see here is a, uh, a clear sort of fitness benefit, long-term fitness benefit for uh, baltering guinea fowl forming into a multi-level society. Now this is a story of, of guinea fowl, but can we find evidence for this elsewhere as well? So I've been very fortunate over the last few years to also work with a fantastic uh, PhD student and now postdoc who has not been in my group, but sort of associated with my group, uh, Ettore Kamalenghi, who's also been uh, asking these questions from a completely different system, the superb fairy wren. 
And he also discovered that superb fairy wrens also live in multi-level societies. So these sort of breeding, so they're cooperative breeders, and these breeding groups aggregate up uh, with other breeding groups and then form sort of stable communities over the course uh, of the winter period. So when breeding is finished. And this coincides with also a period of harshness. Okay, so this is from Lesky group, Lesky Crooks group when she was at ANU. Um, and they, they studied a sort of 40 year data set of the superb fairy wrens and found that there was a, a high peak in mortality uh, taking place during the harsh winter conditions. And what happens during these winter conditions also, also not only are individuals struggling to find food, but of course, all the predators are also hungry. And so Ettore did some experiments where he presented uh, individual alarm calls of both from, uh, individuals from the same uh, community versus different community um, in response to a model predator, Kia Kukubara. And what you'll see here, I hope you can see it, you might hear the playback, and you see this little creature running down here, which looks like a little rodent. This is actually a female super fairy wren that is uh, doing what we call the rodent run. And so this is a high risk uh, thing that she's doing in order to try and avoid stop the sound. In order to try and avoid uh, or distract the predator from what it's doing and try and save whoever's doing the sort of alarm call or the distress call. And he was particularly uh, interested in testing a hypothesis or a, a pattern that had been previously been observed by one of my other colleagues here in Zurich, um, Adria, uh, Andrea Migliano, in the Agda hunter for, uh, gatherer for, uh, foragers that uh, where she found that in their multi-level society, they were much more likely to share food with uh, members from their own household, but also they're quite likely to share food at higher levels of the multi-level society, but at lower rates. And so this is the pattern that uh, was found in this human society in terms of help given. Okay, so on the x-axis here, we have the sort of core social group on the left and the high levels of the multi-level society on the right. And Atere sort of asked the same question of the superb fairy wrens with this helping behavior. And he found exactly the same pattern as what is in the human. So here we have his, his re results are a little bit richer because he also has different levels of helping. So the uh, red, I think, is the rodent run. So they're much more likely to give the rodent run to the members of the core social unit than they are to others and through to the yellow, which are more general sort of coming to inspect the predators. And so here we see sort of uh, another benefit of this multi-level society, which is access to different types of cooperative help. So to sum up uh, all of these bits, I realize I'm uh, getting to the end of my time. I hope that I've been able to demonstrate to you how sort of our work is starting to unravel the combination of the different costs that individuals pay in the short term of being in a group versus the long term benefits that they gain from forming multi-level societies when conditions are really harsh. And that this evidence is also mirrored in this other system of support fairy wrens. And so I think together, all of this hope really highlights what a rich sort of story we can make or what a rich picture we can start to build we start to move away from this sort of nesting uh, social behaviors and start to really study these birds during the non-breeding seasons as well. So where are we going next? As Adriana said, uh, my group is moving at least half the time now and in the future probably more permanently to the Australian National University. And this is located in Canberra. And this is a typical scene in Canberra. We call it the bush, it's called the bush capital. You can see the part, this is the parliament house here. The university is just at the foot of Black Mountain here. It's a really wonderful place to live and work, not just because the nature is amazing, but also if you look, this is Etra in the same paper as he identified a superb fairy and multi-level society. He also did a comparative analysis to identify other systems, other species, which might uh, also have multi-level societies. And all of these, except for the babblers, occur basically in and if not on the campus of the ANU, uh, in the bushland just surrounding uh, the campus and into, into all of the bush reserves that are in the middle of the city and the outskirts of the city as well. 
And among of these are two projects that I'm now involved in. Uh, the first is on the white wing troughs, one of these candidate multi-level societies. So Brenda's doing her PhD on them. And uh, this was started, the system was first studied, uh, first started by Rob Heinton, who continues to lead the work. Uh, he's been working on these books since like, the mid-1980s. And then Andrew Coburn, nor the, uh, the typo in his name there, who also started the Super Fairy Rens in 1986. And this year in December is uh, finally finishing his tenure on this project. And from the start of next year, I'm lucky enough to have a student and some funding to continue this work. And focus maybe less on the cooperative breeding side of the system, which Andrew has studied so well over the last uh, 30 plus years and focusing more on the non-breeding behavior. And I think uh, across all of this work, I hope that you've also seen a general theme of the importance of studying uh, these behaviors in long-term systems. I think that's been a real feature of my work, including in the white and grated system, in the albatrosses, now in the guinea fowl over the last eight years almost, and the, now in the future in the chaffs and the, the fairy lands. And with that, I also want to invite you uh, next summer, we have the European Conference for Behavioral Biology that we are hosting here in Zurich. You can go get a little bit of information on the website. And unsurprisingly, our theme here in Zurich, uh, where we are already host systems like meerkats and wild dogs and so on will be on long-term studies in animal behavior. But of course, we welcome contributions from uh, everyone who has anything interesting to say about animal behavior. And just before I close up, I just want to highlight really how none of this work would be possible without the amazing people that I've been lucky to work with, an amazing team, both the team in Kenya, which was led initially by Brenda here on the left or in the middle of the picture, and is now led by Kennedy in the top left. And uh, my team there has been really dedicated in collecting this data each and every day, and I'm just uh, in awe of the work that they do, as well as the amazing postdocs uh, that have come through my group and moved on to their own positions or to uh, other postdocs. And these are the people who really contributed a lot to shaping how I think and how in developing my ideas and my understanding of social behavior more generally, as well, of course, as the, the number of uh, current PhD students and postdocs and recent uh, graduates from my, my group who contributed to so many different parts of the project as well. Of course, none of this could be possible without the funding, especially the ERC grant that has funded now for uh, nearly four years, my guinea fowl project, and really allowed us to collect the amazing data that can, from which we can really draw some of these great questions, as well as our local partners in Kenya, of course, without whom none of this work would be possible. And that is it for me. Thank you for, my, for your patience and for listening to me blubber on about my ideas. Thank you, Damien, for such a great talk. Um, and we'll open now for questions. Remember, uh, just type in your question mark. And if you're a student or a postdoc, type in S and we'll give you priority. And then um, just don't forget to state your name and affiliation. Um, okay, and I think I saw the previous, yeah, question mark. Raj. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm Raghavind Lagadakkar from the Indian Science. Thank you for this amazing talk about amazing birds. I really loved it. <laughs> I may have missed something, but I had the impression that most of your comparisons were between small groups and large groups. What kind of information do you have about social substructuring within the large groups? Because you use the word multi-level societies. Particularly, do you have any idea of what the costs and benefits are of the substructuring versus no substructuring or less substructuring within the large groups? Yeah, uh, good question. So the Voltaire and Gifal are sort of a little bit different to many of the other multi-level societies in the sense that what we have is uh, we have a bunch of breeding units, like what you might see in a dryers baboons or something like that, uh, family units, but they form during all, uh, you know, outside of non-breeding season, outside of the breeding season, sorry, they form almost completely stable um, 
what we would call groups. So if you didn't know about their breeding, you would just say that it's just one social group. Mm-hmm. And these range from about sort of 15 under really small ones to about 65 other really big ones. We have a couple around 90 that sort of decide some days to be a whole group and some days to be three groups of 30. So we get a little bit of this. It's a really interesting question that you ask. The strength of our project is unfortunately not so much in being able to get a lot of within group structural data. And the reason for this uh, is mainly because of one of the amazing reasons that we have to live and work at Impala, which is that it's completely full of predators, right? Everything is there, but it also makes it a bit difficult for us to really get in and among the groups. So we all, we are restricted to working really from a car. And when you're in a car, you just can't follow the birds on foot when they go through the shrub, the, the bushes and so on. Mm-hmm. So we've really mostly focused on studying the, the sort of bigger sort of social, the group level sort of behaviors. Albeit we've also studied some aspects of um, collective decision-making and so on within groups by fitting all the birds with GPS tags. Mm-hmm. And um, we've also have a couple of groups that are living in and around the fenced areas of the research center where we can follow them on foot. And from those, we know that they have very uh, formal uh, or very structured uh, within group structure, so to speak. So for example, we have uh, very clear dominant individuals. All the males are dominant to all the females. The dominant male has long tenure, sometimes five years or more that we've observed. Uh, all the males, uh, because the males are all father Patrick, they're all uh, brothers and cousins. So there's actually not that much conflict within the group, even though the the, stri- the hierarchy is extremely clear. Um, and Tobit, who's on here, has been doing quite a bit of work in his PhD in sort of trying to understand some of the, the costs or benefits of being high ranking versus low ranking and so on. And that's, you know, like in all societies, we see some classical patterns where you know, low-ranking individuals get beat up more, they're less likely to breed and so on. Uh, thanks. I think it would be really interesting to know if it makes a difference whether you're a group of 60 all the time or sometimes you are 60 because four groups come together and other times you're four different groups. Does that actually make a difference? That would be really interesting to know. Yeah, actually, we have a bit of information on that now that you say it that way. I understand better your question. So Mina, who's a PhD student who's here as well, She's been studying the, the sort of fidelity of space use of the different groups. So mm-hmm. when they sort of have these dry periods, they kind of leave the core area where they breed and so on. And then when it rains, they all come back. And so we have this sort of like seasonal fl- fluxes out and back in. And she studies them when they come back in. And, and basically the groups have very high fidelity to using, even though they're not territorial, groups seem to really have high fidelity in which part of the space they use and she has some evidence that the groups when there's more social turnover within the group then the fidelity goes down so that means there must be some cost in terms of either more conflict about where to go or Mm. um lower or or sort of not as good knowledge about about the range it's hard to quantify exactly how big that cost is but it's undoubtedly present wonderful thank you Thank you, Raj. Um, and our next question comes from Clara. Hi, uh, Clara B. Jones, retired social evolution. Uh, I have a question about terminology. First of all, just beautiful work. And uh, thank you for integrating AI into your uh, research. I have a uh, question about terminology. I think that historically, and you correct me if I'm wrong, cooperative breeding has been estimated to be about 3% in birds. And I think that the criteria used has traditionally been reproductive division of labor plus helpers. And I see that you expand to 11% your, um, I don't wanna say claim, but your definition of uh, cooperative breeding in birds to 11% 
can you explain this and this rap and uh, provide a rationale for doing this? So, yeah, so I'm not going to claim expertise. We have Dustin here who can, uh, of course, correct me in every which way possible. The 11% that I had was uh, actually the rate of precocial breeding, not cooperative breeding. I just wanted to contrast that with the 1.8% of cooperative breeders that are precocial breeders. Right? So it suggests that there's a that the rates of cooperative breeding among precocial breeders is much lower than among altricial breeders. So I, I didn't have, I didn't ever calculate the the rate of cooperative breeding in birds generally. I was that was just the proportion of species that are precocial breeding was eleven percent. So do you accept the traditional definition of cooperative breeders as reproductive division of labor? plus helpers? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, I think the the challenge is, is more in sort of being able to sort of define exactly how much helping counts as helping. Right? And so in the guinea fowl, you know, we showed, we, we found that the mother gives much less of the care behaviors than most of the helpers that help her. And most of those helpers, based on observing who uh, was the offspring of who are her uh, are her previous sons, uh, well, they're not her previous sons, they're still her sons, her sons from previous broods. So I think the guinea fowl generally fit the model of the classical model reasonably well. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, Clara. And our next question comes from Sari Bumble. Um, hi, I'm Sari van Belle. Um, I'm at the University of Texas in Austin studying howler monkeys. I'm located in, in Mexico. And I want to go back to the figure that you showed in which um, with the speed and the straightness of movement mm -hmm. and whether that was kind of just considered a normal day or a, a long distance day type of thing or a solitary individual dispersing. And then you said that when you are in a group on a normal day, it's considered less efficient, the movement of these birds. Um, I was then wondering, well, isn't it this most likely because they are foraging and therefore they are just like moving about? And that made then me question, what are these birds feeding on? And then that also made me think about that little example of those two individuals kind of wanting to go in one direction, but eventually went with all the others. Why would they want to veer off? Would that be like food related? Would they know of some patch that would be more attractive to them? And then again, what are these birds feeding? So that yeah, doesn't make great, uh, great question. So yes, absolutely. Like what you said was completely right. So this, you know, these sort of like orangey dot colored dots here. This is the groups mm -hmm. when they're just doing their normal days of foraging and so on. Okay, but that the, the cost of making that those displacements are still real, but right? it's still the sort of cost of transport that comes when they're just making these sort of uh, return, you know, movements out and back from the roost. But wouldn't there be tremendous benefits as well because they are feeding? Oh, absolutely. Yes, oh. of course. Yeah. So in terms of what they feed on, let me uh, stop sharing this. In terms of what they feed on, you know, that's, um, they're quite omnivorous, actually. So they will feed on seeds and uh, insects as they can find them. You know, they love it when it rains and you have the eruption of termites and they run around like crazy eating all the termites. We've seen them eating small rodents and stuff, elephant shrews and things if they can catch them. Um, so they're quite um, omnivorous. They're capable of eating uh, almost anything, you know, much like chickens uh, can eat everything vegetable or or animal. Um, it's, you know, the sort of food resources that they have do change across seasons. And Kennedy, who's a project manager, he's been doing his master's thesis on that. So we're waiting to uh, see some of those results. But I expect there to be quite some striking changes in the, in the food base of what they're eating across the different seasons. But the main, the key thing is like their food is quite 
widely distributed across different uh, uh, across the environment. It's you know more present on these open glades, so these open grassy areas that are kind of man-made and been maintained for many generations, and where all the megafauna come and sleep at night. So they they pee and poo and stuff on that, and it sort of creates a, a rich grassy patch. But that's also inaccessible to them most of the day because it's open sunshine and they they overheat uh, if they're out there. Regarding the collective decisions, so you know that is actually been one of since you know I started asking these questions using GPS data since uh, 2014 when I went to UC Davis to do my postdoc on baboons, and we still haven't really come with a good means of solving the question of how to find out what is driving these some individuals to go off in one direction versus other individuals in another direction. Um, probably a lot of it is just like how they're feeling on the day, right? If you're with friends and you're trying to decide where to go for dinner, some days you might like Indian food, some days you might want Italian food. You, know, you might have a general preference for one or the other, but it's not going to be the same preference every day. And so I think it's a very challenging question to answer. And if someone had, I think someone will develop the tools one day to sort of make some inference about that. Uh, that person's probably not going to be me. <laughs> but I'd love to have that tool. Thank you. Thank you, Sari. Um, our next question comes from Dustin. Hi, Damien. Great talk. Um, you showed nicely how there's a group size benefit, particularly when they're in, in harsh years. I was wondering, given that there was such little reproduction, I didn't realize it was for that long of an extended period. Uh, I mean, we, we saw something pretty similar with less reproduction and very low recruitment, but did did any what happened to your groups? You might have mentioned this, but did any of your groups fission and dissolve and fall apart during that period? Uh, we had a couple of groups that really struggled and the numbers really dropped. Um, we definitely had some groups that fissioned, uh, other groups that fusioned quite a bit. So I had a mixture, a little bit of everything actually. And it kind of, you know, changed because it's not like one consistent drought the whole time. You know, we had a little bit, little patches with a bit of rain and then they try and do something and then they go off and do something else. We had a period where most of our groups or half of our population all went up to one of the ranches uh, north of Mukenya and they all hung out, Ivan's Ranch up there, I think. They all hang out up there because that had gotten a little bit of rain. And I think it's like in a big sort of valley. So there, there was just a bit more accumulation of food and stuff. So did the did the then as the rains came back in the last six months or so did the did the number of groups in your core study area did that return to what it was and did the the structure of those groups with you know the the relative number of marked individuals stay the same or does it look different now? Uh, pretty much the same. Yeah. So now that we since we had the rains in April May, it's like almost come back to normal. Yeah. And the, the membership to those groups, you know, we just had a meeting today and there's still the same group names and stuff and the same. And of course, some membership changes. We had, I think, one case of one male that switched groups, which is our only ever case of males switching groups. Uh, but basically, all these, the females move much more freely between groups, but all the males are, are largely tied together. We do have one group, the dump group, this sort of big group, you know, that hangs around the dump. Um, and they are about 90 strong and they will, uh, they're the group that often will be some, for some period of time will be all 90 together. And then some period of time will be three groups of 30, but those sub sets of three groups are almost always exactly the same. Thanks. Thank you, Dustin. Um, and I think it's, it's me after. Okay. So that's my question. Thanks, I mean, for, for a great talk. Um, this system sort of reminds me of the capybara system here in Colombia. It's a wetland, dry, and uh, wet season uh, within the same year, which I wasn't really sure if it's the same or you had like long one single year of draw and then a single year, or you just, it just didn't the yeah. same normal uh, temporal seasonality didn't really worked that's one part of the question but then the question really is about um the consistency of the groups so 
when these groups came together, Fusion or Day Fusion, were, my understanding is that within these smaller groups, the membership surface stays stable. But when you join and then Fusion, the ones that join are pretty much the same one, the same groups joining together, or it's fluid the way, the way it works. Yeah, so uh, I didn't explain seasonality. Actually, more than half of my project has been in drought. So <laughs> it's um, uh, what's normal, I'm not sure. But if I talk to people like Dustin, who've been there for much longer, you know, they will tell me that you know, it actually fluctuates between sort of two or three rainy periods a year, and then at least one quite dry period in January, February, March. And you know, when it dries, it dries really quite a lot. And then when it's wet, it's quite wet. It's, it's, a, it's a tropical system. So, um, yeah, so it's quite extreme uh, fluctuations and conditions. Uh, in terms of the membership, yeah, so as I said to Justin, um, you know, what it's reasonably predictable which sets of groups will come together if, do, if they do something together. Usually, if they make these large movements outside of the core area, it's usually sets of birds that have sets of groups that have been roosting together and they'll go. One more, how they decide this, God only knows, right? But you can have three or four. We had 1.4 groups, I think, or maybe even five groups that all together moved like 20 kilometers, walked 20 kilometers north just one day. They're just all up and left. And suddenly there were no GPS tags almost in the populations. Um, the, when they split up again, they largely split back up into their original compositions. As I said, females get sort of transferred between groups. In fact, even during the breeding season, like now there's sort of a bit of splitting up of groups into the breeding season because there's been a bit of rain the last few weeks. And there is even like some males from one group will pair up with a female from another group. So it's, you know, in the, among the low ranking individuals, there's a bit of a, of that happening. But the males, you know, they all come back into their, their groups. Interesting, the chicks will go back to the females group. So there's probably a bit of genetic transfer that way. Interesting. So would you say, or perhaps we could place a hypothesis about cognition, like some sort of um, ability that allows them to track individuals, or at least there is a signature from other group, and I know that groups is the one I'm supposed to join later in the year or whenever the time comes? Yeah, I suspect that there's likely vocal signatures to the groups. I think that's the most parsimonious explanation. You know, when they leave the roost in the morning and you can have like 300 birds all mixed up in one big glade, you know, it's like constant calling. And so I think that in, in that aspect, there's, and they probably identify uh, their group that way. And also say like the most distinctive call when you're out there, you'll hear is a call that reaches far beyond the edge of the group. And they make these kind of all day long. So I think they're also, in a sense, tracking where other groups are as well, or communicating somehow with other groups as well. I think it's a, it's fascinating to understand how it works. But we, I, I can't even claim to get to be close to that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'll give the word to Josh. Hi, uh, I'm Josh. I'm a postdoc with Christy Real at Princeton, uh, working on Greater Anis and now a new project with Palm Chats in the Dominican Republic. And um, I was curious to know about, I, I think you kind of already touched about uh, on this a little bit, but um, yeah, it seems like some of your groups will join these large communal roofs and others don't. And I was curious to know how consistent that is, you know, across years and I, I guess across days and do you have any sense for why some of them are doing it and others aren't? Yeah, good question. Uh, it is consistent in the sense that if you define consistency by being predictable, right? So we can predict to some extent who's going to might, might go with who, but it's not like it's not exclusive in the sense that they surprise us all the time, right? So that big movement that went down to the south that I've talked about in one of the slides, you know, that consisted of three groups that, well, one group of them is a small group that bounces between lots of other groups all the time. And then two of the other groups almost never have, uh, join other groups in, in anything. And yet at this point, they all, all three groups got together and they made this huge, huge movement. Interestingly, also, you could see that the track that they followed sort of 
followed if you made like a ridge of the different home ranges it kind of followed like going down a ridge so that they sort of followed the most common part of the home range of the three groups and then they went into an area that went into sort of a bit where two groups extended that area and then finally they went to like an arm that one group had been and the others uh, not so much i don't know if you can see that in the in the slides Yeah, you can see that here. And let me share the screen again. Right, so you can see and this is red groups here. And you can see that there's like this one of the three groups had done previously this movement out along the road here. And uh, when they went out, they basically followed right down the middle of this part of their range and then exited sort of at the furthest end of that range. So likely that you know they're sort of integrating information um, across the different groups and so on. Thank you, Josh. Um, next question comes from Yingru. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hello, I'm Jing. I'm PhD student working on and more personality in University of Strasbourg and currently doing field work in South Africa. Uh, so my question, uh, so sorry if that is uh, yeah, already be answered in the presentation because our internet was not very good and then we missed part of the presentation, unfortunately. Uh, so my question is, uh, does, does the group of these birds uh, have shows like fish infusion between different seasons? Like, do they have uh, do they some from, for example, from a bigger groups during the dry season? Yeah, so very much it's season driven, right? So in the wet seasons, actually, the the what we call the groups split up into pairs and smaller sets of subgroups of males and so on that can't get females and chase females around trying to get access to females. Then as it dries up when they're not in breeding mode, you know, in what we call the intermediate season, they're typically in what we call the group. Right. So this is a sort of 15 to 65 individuals that we most mostly see them in. And then as it gets to dry and drought periods, that's when we start to see these collective movements that can, that combine, that include multiple groups moving together. Now, all through the year, they all roost communally. So the some aspect of this intergroup thing is maintained pretty much all year round and that we have a number of communal roosts, but some roosts only have one group. Some roosts have five groups. It's quite consistent which groups go to which roost, although they also can move between roosts as well. Yeah, but but the, when they but when they, all these groups come come together, does the small group still stay stable, or do they start to communicate with other groups like group member moving in and out? Yeah, we don't really have good information of like the structure within the group as they're all together. Um, but when they split up again. They're split up back into mostly their original uh, membership groups. So if you went like one intermediate season and the next intermediate season, you'd see the same groups, same individuals all together, uh, even if in the meantime they've all combined or they've all split off uh, into smaller groups. Okay, uh, I just have another question. Uh, it's about so this part, they, they actually split into a smaller group during the dry season. Uh, and you mentioned that they, uh, they are actually less e efficient in, in terms of uh, dispersing compared to the solitary individuals. Does that could uh, like cause a disadvantage for these birds that for the individuals that live in the group? That it, does they like to, like like do have a higher mortality for the group living individual compared to the solitary ones? Yeah, so I mean, they're only solitary when they disperse, right? So the juvenile females, when they go to seek a new group. Um, I just want to highlight, like, you know, the, the sort of movement efficiency is just one cost in a myriad of costs and benefit trade offs that they face, right? So what we can say is that the, the amount of energy they use to move is higher when they're moving in groups and probably in larger groups than it is uh, when they're moving. By themselves to make sort of similarly large movements and that cost is coming really um, from the reduced speed that they're able to achieve right so they can't 
maintain the same high speeds and therefore get the same sort of efficiency benefits in the cost of transport. That's not to say that it's making them more costly to be in a group, right? Because probably they detect predators better. They probably, as they're moving, they, they have more opportunity, more time to collect up seeds and things and, and food along the way. So the net cost benefits probably a benefit still. I mean, it is a benefit to be in a group because they're in a group, right? Um, but that doesn't mean like what we're trying to do is really to, to try and uh, identify some of the different sources in which being in a group might be costly. Thank you. Thank you, Yingyu. Um, our next question comes from Casper. Hi, hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. So um, I'm Casper. I'm based at Bachenigan University. I'm a PhD student working on prey predator interactions and in social groups. Uh, basically, I would like to ask you about uh, one of your older older papers where you looked into leadership in guinea fowls. Mm -hmm. um, so, if I recall co recall co like correctly, um, that was one paper where you showed that leaders at some points monopolize resources, and when there's a critical number of followers uh, that do not participate in this uh, resource acquisition, they basically decide to leave. And then leaders leaders switch from being leaders to followers. So I was thinking uh, what could be the process behind it because uh, you didn't go that much into depth uh, in the paper. I was thinking like maybe it's like a way to reduce predation uh, chances or likelihood uh, in those leaders, but uh, how stable is leadership uh, in your system? That's my question. Yeah, so I think uh, there, when you say leaders initially, the ones that monopolize are more the dominant individuals, right? Which are not necessarily the leaders, um, because we didn't study who took the group there. We just looked at the, the dynamics when they're on these patches. Um, I mean, I think the the sort of the short answer to your question, and this maybe touches a bit on the question that Sari asked earlier as well, which is that uh, you know really the the core hypothesis here is what we call leadership according to need. Right, so these individuals who are excluded from a food patch, they're paying quite a high opportunity cost because as they're waiting in the periphery, if they're waiting for the others to finish, at that during that time they're not feeding. And we know that um, from work, a little bit I touched on it a bit in my presentations. Also, David Jose and Hachels was a postdoc in the group, and he's also finalizing a um, a paper on this about the sort of the, the microhabitat selection. We know that they're quite sensitive. Uh, to the increasing temperature over the course of the day. And also the martial eagle, their main predator, uh, basically they start flying around at about 9, 9 a.m., 10 a.m. So they're really trying to get all of their foraging in in the early morning uh, when it's cooler and there's not so many predators. And so you know these individuals, if they're being sort of displaced from the food, they, um, you know, they're basically not, they're losing time you know, they're reducing their intake rate over the environment uh, quite a lot. So effectively, what they're doing is they're saying, well, it's the cost of us being here with these individuals versus separating, you know, versus, you know, at the cost of not being able to feed, it tips the balance of them moving away from the others, but right? even if they're breaking cohesion within the group. And then it's up to the sort of dominance or those that are still on the patch that in the end, they say, well, actually, it's too costly to stay here by ourselves because... Now, often there's only two or three left at the at the very end, and they you know they're they're bait for predation, and so they run off and rejoin the group. So I hope that answers your question. And cool yeah, PhD, thanks. by the way. Excuse me. And very nice PhD project too. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Casper. Um, next question comes from Luca. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Yeah, thank you for a really interesting talk. Uh, I'm Luca. I'm a PhD student at the University of Exeter, and I study jackdaw social relationships with Alex Thornton. Um, and I was just wondering what your thoughts are about in terms of the costs and benefits of sociality. What do you think are the, is the role of dyadic or differentiated relationships between particular individuals? So I know you mentioned that you don't know a lot about the structure within the group yet, but uh, what would you predict? So, for instance, what I was wondering is 
would individuals be willing to incur certain costs if that means that they can stay with particular partners? Do they have such strong preferences that they would stay with particular individuals? Um, for example, also doing Christian fusion events and things like that. So what what would you predict? Um, yeah, I mean, I very much would say so. Um, you know, what we see in the Guinea file also, some of Tobit's work has been uh, looking at the sort of the fact that these individuals are expressing different sort of social strategies when it comes to interactions with others. And so we see like a lot of subordinate behaviors in the birds. I mean, to me, the craziest thing is if you see, you know, two birds walking along and a subordinate bird overtakes the dominant, it always does like a little bob, like a subordinate signal to the dominant uh, before it continues on. Right? And this happens like almost without fail. Right. So they, you know, to them, it's clearly extremely important to to have somehow or something is really driving these differentiated relationships to exist. And individuals are clearly investing in that for whatever reason. And probably the main reason is just to avoid too much conflict, because if they're in conflict, then they're not paying attention for predators and so on. I will say that in this population, I mean, in the guinea fowl, predation is really a major, major cost, right? There's you know, a sitting guinea fowl by itself is is effectively like food for everything. It's a great size snack. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. Um, just checking the YouTube channel. We don't have any questions so far. And I think we don't have any other questions. So I'm going to go ahead and ask mine. Um, and this one is related to so let me let me rephrase. Let me just think about. It. So in when we think about uh, individuals changing their behavior to reduce energetic cost when the temperature goes up, you mentioned that they do select habitats to do so. But in terms of like actual interactions, do they reduce the social interactions as well? So they go into under their bushes and then they just like stay there laying down or so, or do they keep doing some sort of social interactions to keep social cohesion during this time? Yeah, I mean, uh, I can partly answer that question. So we are trying to, from the accelerometer data to also be able to infer social behaviors because it's quite hard to get that information. But I will say probably the main way to answer your question is that the most surprising thing about these birds is in many ways they're incredibly not social. Uh, they, they express very little like pro-social behaviors. Males will display and feed females and they do this kind of very distinctive bowing display when they get a nice bit of food and, and try and attract the females and so on. And this is what eventually leads to copulations. But well, we see no allo grooming or bird allo preening. Um, but yet they do everything simultaneously, right? So if they're preening themselves, then everyone in the group is preening. If they're dust bathing, then pretty much everyone dust bathes, right? So they really coordinate in their behaviors, but yet for something that's so social with such long term relationships as they have, they have almost no sort of pro social behaviors. I think we've seen like, three or four cases of kind of allo preening. You know, sometimes one bird will kind of peck underneath the tail of the other bird. And once or twice we've seen them like peck on the little sort of red feathers that they have on the back of their head. But beside that, yeah. But that only uh, between adults or also adults and chicks? Uh, pretty much only between adults and chicks. Yeah, they're, okay. and because they're precocial, they're basically kind of taking care mostly of themselves. Uh, they get sort of cover and the adults stand over the top of them or sit on them and so on. Um, and there's just adults will sort of show them where to feed a bit like chickens do, <clears throat> but there's not like care, like what you see in mammals or something like that. Ooh, awesome. Yeah. The female does pay a really high cost. So she, one source of predation of females is that the first three weeks or so, the chicks, they can't fly yet. So they're, they're, um, they haven't grown their, their flight feathers. And so they have to roost on the ground and the female will actually roost with the chicks on the ground. And so we get a lot of females get predated in that time. So the highest predation rate is over female adults? Yeah, or... female breeding females is probably among the highest period of, of predation, I'd say, yeah. Nice, okay. So if 
there are no more questions, I would say um, I will thank Damien again for a great talk and for all your time for discussion, everyone for coming and joining the seminar. And I will close the live.